Guys, thank you for both being here. I'm actually pretty excited for this. This is the first three-way conversation that uh, Daniel and I have been done. The podcast started with me and my friend Dylan, but then he moved off to Canada for a bit. He's currently living out in the woods in Canada, off-grid somewhere. So <laughs> it's, it's been me for a while, but then I enlisted Daniel for a few conversations, and now I've got you, you here, Benjamin, along with Daniel. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. And thank you. A pleasure to be with you. Benjamin, we're going to start talking about your new book today, I think, which has one of the most badass titles for a book I've come across in a while, War for Eternity. I was wondering if you could just tell me where the title came from before we go anywhere else. Well, the, the title, I mean, it would be more accurate as a representation of the content if it were on behalf of eternity. Um, but that's not, not quite as sexy. Um, but really, it, it comes, there, there might be more intrepid podcasts who might know this. It's a slight variation on a phrase that Alexander Dugan used at a speech that, um, uh, where actually where I met him, this is in Stockholm, um, in 2012. Um, he gave a speech where he said we should not fight for the past that has passed, but rather for the eternity that is contained in traditional culture, something, something to that effect. Mm. Um, and so the idea of fighting on behalf of eternity against progress, uh, it, it, it's so core to what the book is about. And I happen also to think it sounds kind of badass. So we stuck with it, twisted a little bit, but stuck with it. Yeah, fuck yeah. And I guess I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I've not read the book. I would love to get my hands on it. But the um, from what I've kind of read around it and the synopsis, it's around this new traditionalist movement, right? And some of these thinkers of the the contemporary far right and and indeed how they may be underpinning the thought of Steve Bannon. Is that correct? And can you say a bit more on Correct. Yes, absolutely. I mean on who these guys are and what the broad implications of their thought is. Yeah, it's it's it it's a it's a wide topic because you know the implication of the of the thought there there are very few absolutes uh, and most people who fall into this category vary the thinking of traditionalists in some way or another. But um uh the traditionalism that I'm seeing and that I'm following is one that comes from a man named René Gonon, who was uh, described as a philosopher of the East, uh, some people. Um, but it's his philosophy and his, his traditionalism that comes via another figure named, named Julius Evola, who was an Italian, some people call him proto-fascist. I sometimes think that that's, that's a misleading way to think about it, but um, uh, certainly a reactionary, anti-liberal, anti-modernist uh, ideologue who collaborated with, with the Mussolini government, was interested in Nazism and, and in supporting Nazism. He thought that both fascism and Nazism were, uh, in fact, too meek um, and, and saw himself as being beyond both of them. He saw them both as promising starts. So that's, that's the kind of degree of, of radicalism, if we want to think in those terms. Um, Evola, Evola becomes an icon to, to far-right activists slowly and kind of sporadically um, in the years after World War II, um, and, and eventually finds, finds his thought being Alexander Dugan, thereafter by Steve Bannon um, and, and some others. So it's, um, you know, the book, I, th I think one thing is fairly affirmative about the work that I've done. This isn't just a passing interest on Steve Bannon's part. He really has read deeply into Evola and has also tried to act and network based on that, that interest. So, um, but traditionalism, if you want to get the building blocks of it, to the extent that it has mattered to, uh, to far-right active, um, it, is, it really circulates around two concepts. One of them is cyclic time. Uh, the belief that rather than this whole trajectory, teleology, um, where we're going to see 
possibly or the possibility of better and greater societies than have ever existed, um, that instead we're, we are in a pattern of constant return. And more specifically, that we move through four ages, uh, golden age, silver age, and dark age, um, and thus that the cycle for the most part is one of decline. Um, and save one cataclysmic moment when dark turns into gold, everything is always getting worse all the time. The second key concept from traditionalism clarifies the first one. Um, it tells us what is golden and what is dark. Um, and broadly speaking, uh, uh, traditionalists would follow the Indo European caste hierarchy, which is, I think, best known these days in Hinduism. Um, where in, a, in an ideal society, um, in especially early Romanos mind, you would have a sort of stratified system with priestly castes on top of society and not, not simply in a position of power, but also having their values saturate culture, politics, and everything. That would descend to a warrior caste, to a merchant caste, and to a slave caste. Um, and as time goes on, those four castes correspond to the four ages of the time cycle I was talking about. So in a golden age, the hierarchy is complete and priests are on top and spirituality uh, reigns as that uh, time cycle progresses or advances, let's say, sorry. Um, <laughs> as it advances, hierarchy itself uh, disintegrates and you eventually see a leveling of society to the level of the slave and materialism overtakes spirituality um, and and broadly speaking social differentiation and stratification as a principle dissolves as well and it's replaced by mass society and Hamas um, everyone is leveled to the lowest value um, so that the, those are the two basic basic principles. Um, you know, where traditionalists will tend to vary is, you know, how literally they take all that, um, and also what else they put into. Elias Avila was very famous for for loading up a great a great number of parallel hierarchies corresponding to spirituality and materialism. He has a complicated understanding of race that opposes Aryans on top to non-Aryans on the bottom, men on to women on the bottom, or, or if, if not even men, it's probably been a masculinity opposite femininity. Um, and uh, geographical northernness opposite geographical southernness, uh, was pointed to the sky and the sun opposite bodily postures uh, pointed to the ground. And there's a, there's a corresponding notion of the spiritual versus the material embedment. Um, and, you know, where, where traditionalism starts to become complex is how, how people see all those things as interrelating, what ones they think are dispensable, uh, whether or not they think the boundaries between either castes or ideals or peoples or races or genders, whether or not they're impermeable. Um, that's that variation, but it is, it sets you up, A, to not, not believe in progress, and thereby to be anti-modernist in a liberal certain sense, um, but also to see the creation of large-scale collectivities as a problem to be solved and as, as a harvest and decline. Um, and thus that if you believe that you might be able to do something or witness a return to a gold age, it necessarily involves a shattering of that mass homogeneity into something more stratified. If it is a hierarchy, if it's, as I write about in my book, gratification, where there's a sort of, dare I say, separate but equal ethos that reigns, those are some of the variables. But that's, um, I, you know, that's a basic. So if, if I can ask a question. Um, so you've said something about how traditionalism um, is a way to formulate an opposition to modernity and to progress and to liberalism and to facilocracy and all those things, at least in the words of Dugan. So how would you evaluate or how would you analyze the different incorporations of traditionalism? On one hand, there's Steve Bannon. On the other hand, there's, there's Dugan. And we know these people are agents. But the way that they take on board this critique of modernity is different among them. So Bannon is America, is, is, is democracy. There's a lot of liberal values there, whereas Dugan is something else entirely. So if you could talk a little bit about that difference. 
yes, I, it, it, it's not, not quite as different. I, I, would, I would point out, well, let me back up, Daniel, uh, first, before we, before we get into specifics. The specifics are interesting, but one, one thing that when we go into traditionalism is that this isn't really a political ideology, and it was never meant to be a political ideology. Um, there are, in fact, I'm, I could give you names. There are that in the world who will be very bothered by the fact that I'm describing traditionalism in the same breath as I do politics, because uh, the belief in a cycle that is um, doesn't leave a lot of room for activism and influence uh, coming from human, fatalistic in addition to pessimistic worldview. Um, so it. And not only does it not outline a, a, a place on its own for act, it also is, is, is quite, despite everything, unspecific about what types of political reforms it would call. Uh, you know, what is the traditionalist view of single payer healthcare systems? Um, or, you know, or, or I don't know, organized labor. Uh, it, it, it lacks that specificity. Um, for some people, that's part of its threat, its danger. Others, that might, you know, be its its claim to legitimacy. To, to um, but it also means that there's going to be wide divergence among people who claim to follow this as to what the actual specifics are when you get into the nitty gritty. Having said that, that was a long throat clearing. I'm sorry, sorry, Daniel. Um, having having said that, um, Alexander Dugan is is notable for looking at the world and saying, okay, these various forces, modernity, uh, tradition, they actually fairly neatly align with geopolitics. Um, we have the avatar of modernity in the United States. Boom. And, and the forces that oppose it are, are tradition by default, um, essentially. Um, Bannon's retort to him, and I trace this uh, is that modernity is an element of the United States, and it might be even a definitive element for uh, portions of American society, but that is a deeper pre-modern essence that Dugan has overlooked, um, and, you know, which preceded and will live beyond me, that modernity is a parenthetical movement in the United States, just as it is in world history. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that Dugan to, in, in that instance, revision of the United States. Uh, Dugan says no, <laughs> Dugan disagrees, and, and that's one of the reasons for their, um, for their quarrel with one another. I mean, they also have entirely opposed views of China, which we could get into, but it's, it's all on the same basis. What they don't disagree about is that the world is in defined by this opposition between modernity and tradition. And that, and that states actually intelligibly can be used as, as means to analyze it. Nice. Um, oh, and if you allow me just to say another comment to see if yeah, I can sure. steer the conversation to an interesting place. Um, in in sure. your view, not that it's not being mind blowing uh, up to this point, but in your view, looking at the idea of Nuo Magia and this so-called war of ideas in the Nuo sphere, that is, is a concept that Dugan explores. And given how traditionalists have a weird relationship with modernity, how do you feel that they answer this question, the question of the internet on one side and the nuo magia? So how do, how, what's the relationship between these two things in the mind of these traditionalists? Namely, Dugan okay, and I don't know if that's, if that's clear. Okay, cut a fair amount. Um, you cut out a fair amount, Daniel. Oh, okay. So I'll try, to, I'll try to say it very quickly once again. What's the relationship that uh, Dugan and Bannon, and obviously their traditionalist background, what's the relationship between that, between the concept of nuo magia, and, and the emerging digital age? Mm -hmm. So the idea would be that maybe the digital age and the internet has accelerated or contributed to this nuo magia. Uh, is that something that that you can talk about for a little bit. Mm -hmm. it, it's, I, yeah, I wish, I wish I could say more about it because I don't have a lot of 
um, data, so to say, to report uh, about that particular aspect of this. I mean, you know, another figure swirling around in that conversation, both and for Bannon is Nick Land. Um, yes. um, so, but I haven't spoken to them about that about the digital digital universe and what, what that means. They do, on the other hand, have a lot to say about artificial intelligence, um, you know, which is, of course, that's not the same thing. Um, you know, so I wanna, I wanna be clear before going into that as a parallel response to what you asked that, you know, that really we are talking about different things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Dugan, both Dugan and Bannon see AI as being, as being again a late stage of modernity that is this specifically an elaboration of its secularism, um, you know, with the belief that God is dead, um, you know, Dugan is up in that as being man is dead, um, and and he means when I say man is dead, I mean the gendered. I don't mean humankind. I mean I mean man. He also sees he sees artificial intelligence. As, as being a sort of parallel to feminism, parallel feminism as well, uh, that these are about erasing, um, er, you know, er, erasing humanity as it, as it would be manifesting in in, in men. Hmm. Um, so, and 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 Bannon too, where where they, you know, an interesting place where they divide the question, because Bannon has been talking about artificial intelligence a fair amount as well, um, is, and I was just mentioning this, is the role of China. Um, Bannon sees, thinks it's no accident um, that the avatar of modernity in his mind, not in Dugan's, uh, but in Bannon's mind, China, he sees as, as pushing this forefront of, of destroying humanity, um, of pushing artificial intelligence wherever it can and where it can't, you know, importing chips and bodies, increased mechanization and, the, and the, the monitoring of human beings, um, because it is, it is a, a sort of pseudo-religious movement or an anti-religious movement uh, coming out of China. Dugan, Dugan, on the other hand, thinks it's great that China has some command of artificial intelligence because China, the strength of its state, uh, shows that China can subdue and subordinate uh, uh, technology and material. Um, technology being an example of the to the will of active um, or the the social whole, which in his mind is 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 more or less aligned with the state and government of of China. <laughs> um, so I'll leave it there. That's where my my conversations with them have gone in this broad broad topic. I mean, so on that point, the fact that you have spoken to these guys. It's interesting in itself, right? I was just checking out some of the stuff on your website. And I came across one of your papers, basically arguing around the, the ethical implications of being involved with, with right wing or far right figures and, and what it means to do research in communication with them. I think on the one hand, people argue that maybe some, some of these ideas, if indeed they are dangerous, should not be engaged with. Your approach, as I'm taking it, seems to mm -hmm. be that actually, maybe there is a danger in engaging, but there is also value, intellectual value, in speaking to them and finding out what these guys are going through their heads and, and what they can even contribute to the debate. I think, if anything as well, could just draw a line around. Maybe not yeah. to the debate, but we need to understand, to just draw a red line around something and go, don't go here. Um, yeah, go on. I would be concerned in time someone will say something that's good and worthwhile. Um, and it would be a shame to never know that. Um, I don't really like drawing that red line around anybody. Um, mm -hmm. granted, you know, it, it's important to note, despite despite the fact that I'm publishing a book more or less is in kind of a spirit of a journal of journalism. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a scholar. I'm, a, I'm an academic. I think that everyone should be studied. I think that everything should be studied. Um, I'm, I'm really uneased and unsettled by anybody who would say, I don't want to know anymore. Um, you know, if we excuse, if we excuse our own curiosity, 
uh, you, you know, relieve ourselves the burden of asking questions or scorn people who, who do, I think we're in a really bad place. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, that's, that's a lot of where the ethics, you know, come from. I wasn't able to get as close to, let's say, Dugan and Olavo de Cavallo, who's another figure in the book, um, as, a, as I was to Bannon, or as I were, was, who I followed, John Morgan, um, you know, is, is one figure, an early, early publisher for Arctos, who I've, you know, really followed for a long time. And, you know, the, no, the knowledge you could, you don't need to be a scholar, you both seem like, like real intellectuals, you, you don't need to be especially inquisitive, you know things about people who you know, in the colloquial sense, you have information and knowledge of them that's different, totally different than that of a personal interview, like a cold sort of investigative journalist. Um, and that that type of knowledge, that kind of intangible, that's specifically what I see my method as being designed to do. So if we forego that uh, for the sake of maintaining my own political purity in, in the untouchable you know, sheen of moral perfection on, on my writing, we've assured some sense against people. And that's what, that's what a lot of my, yeah, some of my recent academic writing has, has gone toward. Mm. Do you spend time talking to not just the leading figures of these movements, but just general members of the populace around them who are drawn to that ideas? Because I'm quite curious if there are any typologies or things you observe from the types of, I mean, I guess one thing would be white people would presumably be the ones being drawn, but is there anything more than that? <laughs> oh, everyone, there's one reason I talk to other scholars of the far right, why it's so interesting. Everyone's in the far right. There are Muslim, descent, Jews, trans, everyone ends up, and ends up, it, it's, it's a fascinating place. But yeah, pri prim primarily white men. Um, you know, what's, you know, what's interesting though, is, I mean, I've studied right-wing populists, I've studied the rank and file and, and leaders there, I've studied more militant uh, groups, um, you know, neo-Nazis, people self-identifying white nationalists and things like that. The traditionalists on the right, they they were seriously like the last sector of of that movement of that scene that I ever thought would be represented in the halls of power around the world, because part of their typology is and it follows a piece of writing by by Julius Evola. Part of their their typology is withdrawal and a disavowal of politics and huh. society. Um. You know, you both, I mean, we were talking land is, is kind of in the sphere a little bit as well, but um, the notion that the turning of the ages is faded and that we were to be in a dark age right now and liberalism and modernity were supposed to be running the, the earth right now. Um, and there's nothing you can do but wait. Time is the weapon you have. Um, and therefore you need to just draw back and preserve yourself and hope that you live across the zero point, that fires empathy. Um, you know, so the fact that we see Bannon showing up and Dugan, these, you know, I call them hurricanes of activity in my book, uh, is surprising sociologically, culturally, um, but it's also a, a sort of a front to tradition. Mm -hmm. That, that's very interesting. So I want to ask you a question a little bit around sort of uh, to disambiguate a couple of concepts. So on one hand, we, we know that traditionalism advocates this sort of return to a, let's say, Indo-European uh, uh, way of life, case life, etc. So there's this palingenesis, this rebirth of something in the deep past maybe even from nomadological times. But on the other hand, we have people like <clears throat> Nick Land and Bannon who are, in, and even, even Dugan, uh, who are in, in a certain sense, accelerationists. Some people associate Dugan with chaos magic, mm -hmm. being that in the age of the internet, throw more fire, throw more fuel to the fire, accelerate how it burns so that we reach the zero point faster. So it has to do with that accelerationism. So how do, how do these two different 
vectors pull at each other. It's a, it's a heck of a question, Daniel, and it's it's one I don't resolve. Um, you know, Bannon said something to me as, as a means of this topic, and I write about this, so it, it was an offhand comment, but he described Trump as a man in time. Does that mean anything to either of you? That's very Heideggerian, isn't it? It could be Heideggerian, yes. Uh, I, I know it better, <laughs> just, just what I've been studying and what I write about. I associate it more with Savitri Devi. Oh, wow. Um, there is, there's a brand of kind of traditionalism-ish stuff um, that, that sees that the turning of ages, it all, it all under, but certain influential figures can come in history and push it forward, all right? Um, I, I've, I've used in my classes before when we talk about this is imagining that, you know, we're all on like a, a big circular train back and the train is a place to go, but it can slow down and break down and stop, um, you know, and, and ultimately someone can come on and rush it forward in a certain direction. Um, and, you know, Bannon referred to Trump as a man in time, and then we went on to discuss Bannon as a figure who does not understand, who does not understand the currents of history um, and the secrets of the cosmos, nor his own role in history, but has the characteristics and the power to play a, a, a predestined role, namely to be a destroyer, to be a force of destruction, uh, to pull apart, to disintegrate. Yeah. And thereby, it's actually not chaos. It's in their minds, it's it's destruction to bring order out of chaos. Um, this is this is another key part of it. Um, so I don't know. I never got Steve to act. Steve never acted me. Yet I read Savitri Devi, and I thought, uh -huh, they're not Trump. He's the man in time. Um, but he got pretty darn close to <laughs> to saying that. Um, and at, at any rate, it seems, it would seem as if Savitri Devi and Bannon were, were, were working with the same conceptual framework for dealing with this, this concept of cyclicality, the question of fate, the question of intervention and activism in a world that seems fated and where destruction um, is, is the only pathway forward. But it's, none of that is to say, Daniel, that it's not still an unresolved problem, hmm. right? Um, this is this is one, one of the tensions that exists there, and a fascinating one at yeah, that yeah. because that amounts to an eschatology, to a soteriology, and and that's why there's so many so connections with with also like theosophy, and and that sort of mm -hmm. edge of things on, on the occult edge. So, the way that these things, these fluxes, uh, if you want to use the Deleuzian word for it, or these machine, these in the words of of land, these machinic desires, the way that they feed onto each other and they talk to each other. And they end up sort of ramifying and bringing about certain states of affairs. That's fascinating. Because there's literally mm -hmm. a, a lineage yes. Yes. between Bannon and Trump and then these ideas and how they unfold mythologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and to pick up something you were talking about earlier, Donya, first, do you read Russian? You've read Noel no. Machia. No, um, I've okay. sort of... No. I wish. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, because one, one key point, I mean, to bring this to geopolitics again, um, you know, there were a couple figures. One was Jason Durjani, um, and the other is Dugan, who saw in Iran some special role to play in world history. Um, you know, for Dugan, he spends a lot of time writing about Iran, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, the the ideal golden age in which spiritual values are placed above. Another way to put that in in more standard political science terms would be a theocracy. Um, that that's the actual goal <laughs> um, for for one's figures following traditionalism, and um, you know that's the grounds by which Dugan looks to Iran as a sort of ideal state. 
Um, you know, another figure who I studied, Johnny, thinks that Iran, you know, is, is even has deep, uh, a sort of deep destiny uh, also to unite with the West. Um, uh, but Bannon, of course, looks looks at that completely differently, um, and and fundamental opposition between East and Persia, um, and it was on those grounds actually I report on this in the book in 2018. Bannon and Dugan met in Rome, um, in secrecy, met met all day long, um, and he was making a traditionalist case to Russia that. Uh, to to do and that Russia needed to unite with the United States on the grounds of its common spiritual heritage in in as part of the Judeo Christian West, um, and Dugan looked instead at that and said, you know, it doesn't the particular religion doesn't matter. What matters is spirituality writ large. The United States is secular. Must we want no part in it? Um, but that's this is another fault line that they <laughs> that they were working with each other on. Mm, very interesting. Mm. Do you get a sense of what the golden ages they are expecting will look like? No. <laughs> um, I've described it as a sort of a frame with no picture inside. Um, we understand that the principle of stratification in some shape or form would be pronounced and elaborated, um, that it would not be anything like a utopia, let's say, where sameness was, uh, you know, was the criterion of virtue. Um, but no, and it's... <laughs> You know, this is this is part of. I mean, Daniel, you you know, all of this thought that looks for looks back and looks to a sort of rebirth and wants to see a lost glory or a lost brought to life again. Um, we knew this with the Romantics in Europe that you know they couldn't quite ever emulate what what they want, what they, how they want this whole place to look like, um, you know, and in, in traditionalism, goals are, are so enormous because, you know, some people are thinking that the last golden age is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago, um, you know, to try and bring that into practical politics and say, okay, this is what we want to do. And tomorrow, if we make this change, we're going to be closer to our golden age. Is, is so um, so no I mean again some people would find that very disturbing um, that there's there could be an agenda and a sort of spiritual incentive to destruction and, and chaos um, without actually a goal of where it's leading mm. where it's, where it's headed. well I think there is something very alluring about the the fantasy of destruction and creative destruction. Like I feel it within myself sometimes. Like I sometimes find myself mm -hmm. imagining the end of the world and what it would look like. And then I kind of have to catch myself and be like, huh? well, like <laughs> that's there. Well, Hollywood knows that and does that as well. It's, it's kind of a trope, a mythological <laughs> trope, uh, very pertinent to our age, I would say. Yeah, well, yeah. that's a point to explore, isn't it? The fact that the dystopia and the apocalypse are tropes that are so common in in art and movies and music at the moment it's like something is obsessed with that mm -hmm. yes yes i mean and, and it, you can often ponder i'm very interested in, in mythology i teach nor i used to teach norse mythology um here at the university and you know just to think of that 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 trope as well and there's a cyclicality of course there it's part of the indo-european world but you know you can presentations and see okay what you know chaos is a very unspecific term but what is it that is chaotic and when the chaos subsides what is it that it turned and allowed the viewers and everyone else to say aha now we are out of chaos and back 
into a world of order for this reason. You know, this is more. So, um, you know, but it, it would do as I get the feeling for either of you to say that, you know, a lot of these narratives of chaos have to do with, with aimlessness uh, or helplessness. Um, and there's, there's a more kind of sociological, cultural aspect to that and a more political one. Um, you know, and I think in some cases, chaos uh, or dystopia has to do with the complete loss of sovereignty by people. Uh, alternately, the inability to orient oneself in the world and to think that there's anything given about who you are, um, where place, bodies, you know, time don't mean anything anymore. Um, and breaking out of chaos could mean sovereignty politically. It could also mean identity in, in all of the manifestations that we think about. That reminds me of the text by uh, Serkov, Without Sky. I don't know if you're aware. Uh, Serkov, uh, Vladislav Serkov. No, no, no. So he's kind of this agent who is also in the same circles as Dugan, and he's, he's been involved with um, sort of Russian politics, and he's currently, I guess, in Ukraine. But um, some say he, he actually, you know, understands and orchestrates some of the active measures that the Soviets kind of, that the Russians, sorry, <laughs> use uh, in order to influence the world. And this kind of leads me to, to, to the question that I wanted to ask you, right? Mm -hmm. so, in fourth political theory, like we know that, rather, I, I want to make, establish a comparison between the fact that, you know, one of the big trends of post-modernity and late capitalism is kind of a fragmentation of meaning, nihilism, et cetera, right? There's, there's this fragmentation that comes from digital technology, the internet, it just breaks everything down into fragments. On the other hand, uh, we know that, you know, Dugin would like a thousand and one nations to bloom. He wants to blow up American hegemony so that uh, Eurasia uh, and the person of Russia could become sort of a big fish uh, in the pond with, so Russia not being equivalent to Norway, but a civilization at this, at this level. Um, so geopolitically, these are trends, even though philosophically Dugin kind of doesn't solve it because they are agents mm -hmm. more than philosophers in a way. How do, you, how do you see this panning out in geopolitics in the events that we're seeing right now, like the dissolution of the EU, or at least uh, the struggle that it's going through? Well, I mean, it, it's hard not to see where they're coming from in their analysis, at least, to say nothing of their prescriptions. Um, that I mean, are are we not living in an age of fragmentation? Um, and you know, so I mean, certainly at the level of geopolitics, we see we see stress being placed on all all multinational organs, new stress being placed on it, and and populism being one of the primary agitators. There's a case to be made that that you know populism actually isn't doing much at the more fundamental level. Brazil is an interesting case study where, um, you know, where the, the president and his, his sort of pseudo guru, you know, have been pushing against China to break Brazil out from China and start disintegrating that, that BRICS uh, uh, collaboration. It, it all is essentially surface level because the, the state underneath, I suppose you could say the deep state, is, is too entwined with, with China for the president to do anything. Um, you, you, you still see a, a new type of stress, surface level, rhetorical, discursive, or, or not, or deeper. Um, it, the, the interesting thing, Daniel, is, if you, if, is a, a counter example to that, someone might say, would be the internet. Um, or the digital, the digital world. Not many of the people who we've been discussing would, would make that case, you know. But is the internet in in the digital universe that a place of unification or fragmentation? I don't know, <laughs> um, exactly. but it's certainly the 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 case that that we essentially it, it's a Allowing us to break in, into small communities in some in some sense, and to 
uh, reestablish particularisms um, that might actually be less less available to us in the non-digital world leads me to think that yes, this isn't actually a place of mass homogenization. This is a place of, of fragmentation, and, and you know, and there we would see a sort of parallel with you know between the digital world and and the non-digital political official political world. It's just hard to say. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd be very interested. I'd probably learn more about this listening to you two. My my feeling is you've you've discussed this more. What do uh, you think? We've definitely explored this a lot. Um, I think one comes with the other. I think the digital age uh, is you know part of the same thing, which on one side is called you know traditionalist revival, and on the other side is called neoliberal capitalism so it's kind of the faces of the same entity which dugin calls the antichrist because he says modernity and the antichrist are the same thing because they both say i don't need god i am enough um and so i believe that that it comes in a point in history where we're going to have to start dealing with the implications of ai going rogue um which is also a very interesting sort of positioning for Ben and being like, okay, China gets AI, this is gonna be interesting. So indeed, you can map some trends of geopolitics mm -hmm. on top of this, I guess. Mm. I mean, my sense is that it's, it's about these subcultures, right? These tribes that are arranged irrespective of where people are in physical space, but shared memes, shared music, shared ideas. The tw I, I think the kind of I'm always fascinated by this undercurrent in the 20th century of of subcultures emerging. There's this guy, David Chapman. Do you ever come across David Chapman's website, Meaningless? So he's a I think he's a Buddhist AI programmer by day or was, but he writes this blog basically tracing mm -hmm. what he, the history of the 20th century in terms of the subcultures that came out of it. So first the hippie movement, but then also the radical Christian movement in America around the sixties, both with mm -hmm. strong universalist religious undertones. So what that meant, the hippies were like universal peace, one love, everyone together, where the Christians had this, again, a, a unifying strand, but it was, we need to go back to the religion. Then the next wave, seventies or so, you got punk rock and a few other things around there that also had a strong collective identity, but gave up the claim to universalism and went into a kind of nihilism. It was like, we're gonna do our own thing over here and fuck the rest of you guys. And that then evolved into heavy metal. Yeah. We yeah. get, I think these, the, I mean, these are the examples I'm most comfortable expressing because I'm a metalhead by, by I was gonna say by trade, metalhead by ear, I would say. <laughs> but I think <laughs> you can see, yeah. you can yeah. see others in other places then the oh, internet okay. in its early genesis gives the kind of fragmentation the the subcultural scenes that were based in a specific grounding in a specific place kind of die in the 2000s because this shit's going on online now and what yes. they did was they gave i think a quasi-religious significance to a life that had lost anything of religion, religion being defined in the broad sense of religari, that which binds people together. I think that is what people ache for and what mm -hmm. we are always chasing in one direction or another, something akin to religion. And I think we are at peak mm -hmm. fragmentation now, I think, because even, even the subcultures that existed are like metal, quite frankly, I think is a parody of what metal once was it isn't the same force. It's, it's mostly nerdy outsiders as opposed to being kind of sexy and edgy. But I see in the internet yes. the ability to at least create some kind of religious subculturalism, but there are, it can go in infinite directions because anyone can stand, anyone with charisma and who can a, a, arrange a congregation around him can build. And that's where I see that where we're at. And, you know, Daniel, you were just bringing in artificial intelligence there. I know you spoke to Pat Ryan last week, who brings in this sense that what happens if and when these 
religious subcultures get tangled up with artificial intelligence that can do the sort of things like the Cambridge Analytica guys were doing. Finding people who would be ideal members of the congregation and pinging them the message and being like, come and join on. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I mean, the, the, wow, there's, there's a lot to say about this. You know, initially there's a, there's a scholar, Dylan Clark, actually, of subculturalism, um, you know, who writes a lot about uh, you know about the death of subcultures um, in the in the old way, and and also the notion that they were sort of especially those that were more invested in style and expressive culture, um, but also espoused a political cause were were sort of fated to to fall away, um, and that really punk never died. It died as an expressive subculture, but moved into some sort of a political cause when the when the quote is the threatening pose was replaced with the with the threat. Um, you know, a sort of maturation process of a subculture that becomes political. But, um, you know, the, the one element is kind of cliche to say that these online subcultures, uh, you know, lack a connection to place. And that, you know, part of the vision of the tribalism they're striving for normally have place as one of its unifying and grounding, literally grounding components, and it's not there, and therefore there's this angst, and the subculture is never really going to satisfy itself, and it will spin out. The other problem, and this is where, I mean, traditionalists might have something to say. I don't think that they exclusively have something to say, but um, it's, it's the potential absence of history uh, in all of this. So many of our collectivities, whether they exist in subcultures or whether they exist in liberal formulations of belonging in a nation state, in a multi-ethnic uh, immigrant-based nation state like the United States where I live in, they're predicated on the notion that we can form a meaningful collectivity and find place, broadly speaking, in our lives, rallying around our shared future, right? If I, if I go out into the city um, fairly close to me right now, I the chance that I will share a lot of me with the people in terms of my parents and the grandparents having, you know, similar historical experiences is fairly low, but at least maybe we can congregate around the notion that our future is the same. And, um, you know, the, the possibility that, that not having a shared history uh, is, is, is something that people are having toward and unable to, to get to is a potential problem here. <laughs> Uh, I think a very deep problem and one that one that that deserves some I, I don't want to completely abandon to the most uh, fanatical and reactionary voices in society to discuss. Let me ask you a question very simple you spoke you spoke about the zero point a while ago. What does that look like mm -hmm. in your eyes? Oh in my purpose? Yeah what, what's your what's I'm your not sure I Sorry? I'm not sure that I believe in this stuff, mm. stuff Daniel. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if, I, if I'm trying to find, if I'm trying to find sense in what they're saying and be, you know, I always tell my students to go there with ex who are studying to try and see the world through their eyes and see what's good about it. I mean, I certainly, I, when we were talking about Hollywood's and tropes, I think there's a point at which um, sovereignty might not only be lost, but but might be understood fully as having been lost. That might be a zero point for people who formerly thought that they had sovereignty and control over their lives. Um, you know, maybe no one has it, but if we socially, discursively believing, speaking about it as though we don't have it, that, that could be a serious problem. Um, gosh. Yeah, I'm. I'm. That's that's my first thought. Mm. Um, I was just seeking to get your your point of view, obviously, no because, <laughs> because it seems to me that both uh, these characters that we're discussing, mainly Bannon and Dugan, and, and obviously their traditionalist inheritance, that they do point towards a zero point after which the dark age becomes the golden age. Uh, we do know as well from you know neo techno delusian guys like nick land who look at the future and and write all the, the craziest stuff we see that they're you know claiming that you know what 
Nick Land has a sentence which is about garbage time is running out. Can what is playing you make it to level two? Talking about a phase shift as well from the technological point of view. But I don't think that that's too different from what the salvation theories of Dugan and, and the, the traditionalist. It feels like it's, it's as cathology as it was written playing out in front of our eyes. It's the end times. I mean, it's always the end times, but now it feels like even more. Yeah, I mean, the other day I heard the, yes. the expression epistemological Armageddon. Yeah, I mean... Uh-huh. Yes. Well, anyway, to... Sorry, a very large piece of machinery driving past. That's uh, just modernity, don't worry. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> epistemological <laughs> Armageddon. I mean... One wonders, you know, to kind of think in Dugan's, you know, wants to see the this fragmentation, you know, multipolarity is kind of just the opening salvo in in a greater process of disintegration. Um, you wonder, though, as well, if you know, t let's just as a thought experiment to pull that to its to its utmost extent, if you know whether or not hyper individualism, which Dugan claims is you know, is actually a hallmark of what he doesn't like. You know, if the ultimate bipolarity is is a complete disintegration of collectivity, um, where we all have our own individual epistemology, and where you know, in contrast to the, to the liberal dystopia he describes, there's actually not some global overstate um, being you know, resting on top of us, that there's no collectivity between, between the individual and the mass human society. Um, you know, you, I, I see that as a sort of dystopia uh, as well. I, I worry about, uh, you know, I worry about to the extent, you know, that, that nobody cannot have any sort of collectivity, any sort of shared value. It's not the direction that Dugan would want to go in, <laughs> necessarily. But it's uh, if 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 we really had an extreme case, that would sound pretty terrible to me, as well. And I'm not much of I'm not as much of a epistemological relativist uh, to really want to act on the path with him, anyways, on these points. Um, so so yeah, absolute fragmentation of truth, religion, of of belonging, of society. Ones you know, there's a possibility and also quite terrifying to me. Hmm. Incredible. Um, I guess the only thing that comes to mind as actually in following like this, this previous answer is uh, Dugan says that the subject of fourth political theory is the that sign. And he compares that to the subject of, you know, liberalism, who, which is the individual. And it feels like, uh, obviously, he, like, yeah. My, my view on, on Dugan is that he's more of an agent and arguably an effective agent rather than a philosopher who solves philosophical problems at depth. However, he says that the Dasein is the subject of the fourth political theory, and it doesn't seem too foolish to track wherever he got that from. Um, can you, could you say something about, about that, about the mm -hmm. Dasein as a yes. subject? Well, as, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's very, I think this is philosophically hard for some of the same reasons that you do, that we don't, you know, uh, thinking of, thinking of a way of the world as, as the unit of protection uh, for politics, that this is what we uh, organize society to promote. Um, you know, I, it's if we were to distill that quite a bit and trying to get get to a place, where, you know, where you making policy out of it, you would look to some sort of tribalism. It's not, you know, I'm coming out broadly out of of cultural anthropology as my my academic field, and it's not, you know, it's not that unlike when we talk about culture groups, you know, which is a much maligned, I have to say, though an attacked con coming from ethnography and anthropology that you know the, the, we're exchanging essentialisms for other essentialisms and okay your mob boundaries you're going to say that nation states actually are modernist constructs that were blind to the cultural diversity that existed on the ground level 
okay, the next step always be a new set of boundaries that are going to be subject to a new set of, of critiques. And I see that as being, I don't, I don't see how, how do don't think that it's any mistake that a lot of the ethnographers and cultural anthropologists that he studies are very old mm. um, as well. It's, it's a struggle to think about, about what someone actually does with this again. Okay. Design, which design, where do the borders go? And that's one thing, you know, he'll, he'll laugh and, and chuckle if you, if you even talk to him about, you know, multipolarity and where do the borders go? he clearly saw a hard border in Georgia, right? And uh, Abkhazia and, and Ossetia. Um, but where's, where, what about all the fuzzy borders? Um, what about Ukraine, Novorossiya? I mean, all of those, uh, all of those places, you know, where, where, where it's a struggle, mm. um, that's where it matters. That's where the problem is, um, you know, but, but I think he would be anticipating the, the person who would look at that and say, oh, well, we can't do it. Throw up your, your, your arms and return to the subject of liberty, mm -hmm. return to the individual. Um, that's all that we can do at this point. Uh, the one thing that we can be sure of the boundaries, which we can, we can firmly rest on in, in some, some case, but oh, please, you were going to say something. Um, no, I was just going to sort of uh, intervene and say that, perhaps one of the vectors of a a action uh, for many of these players on all sides, some of them are traditionalists like Bannon and Dugan, but of all sides would be fourth generation warfare. So war of information of ideas. And it feels to me like much of Dugan's sort of impact, uh, if not the biggest is on that sphere, um, given the, the, the sort of the influence that he, that obviously other players are having within this, this fourth generation warfare. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's one reason why, I mean, Bannon, you know, I, I write about this in the book. I mean, Bannon, his, his day job right now is fighting against China. Um, that's his full time occupation and he's paid, he's paid more than I am paid. <laughs> Let's put it that way to do that. Um, and he thinks that Dugan is the key. He thinks Dugan is the key to changing common sense in Russia away from, away from its geopolitical instincts toward China and toward a reorientation toward the United States. It's not, in other words, to form a policymakers. I mean, we can sit and discuss what Dugan is. Is he a philosopher? Is he an agent, an operative? Um, you know, and you know we probably would not settle that question um but he's not a policymaker. we know that and he's not a a public politician he's not a formal whatever power he has it's it doesn't appear to be publicly formal um and it is this battle of ideas we i describe that as metapolitics in the book i'm pulling that from other research into the right that that i that i do um but it the doctrine would say that yes, you you really want to make lasting change that incends the rule of any particular political leader. Then you turn not to the politician, you turn to the ideologue, you turn to the guru, which is what's going on. Fantastic, Benjamin. I'm mindful we've been talking for an hour. Would you like to look at wrapping up now? Yeah. Yes, I'm afraid so. I would, I would love, I, it's a treat to be able to have this type of conversation with anyone ever, so, but alas. <laughs> Fuck yeah, we should do it again sometime if you'd like. I'd love to, I'd love to. Wicked. I mean, as a last thing, that. would you like to say anything about the book or where people can find you? Uh, available at fine bookstores everywhere, as Christopher Hitchens used to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I hope people, I hope people read it. Um, you know, it was, it was uh, I wrote it incredibly quickly, um, but I think that there's a lot to chew on in this. Uh, available at Amazon, should be available in any bookstore near you. Um, you get it at IndieBound as, uh, as well to support local bookstores. Not a bad thing. Nice one. Right, thank awesome. you so much for joining us, mate. Yeah, thank you both. Thank so you, Benjamin. Much. Take care of yourself. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Roland.
Bye bye. See you.